Thank you so much. Hi there, folks. Um, I am speaking to you from Austin, Texas, because uh, yesterday was my husband's birthday and he asked me to come to Texas for his party and I had to say yes. So originally I was supposed to be in Berlin now and hopefully next year I will make it because I love this conference. Um, so I don't know how many of you recognize this graphic. Uh, <laughs> this is from a magazine that doesn't exist anymore called Mad Magazine. And, um, you know, it's pretty obvious what's going on here. These people are pretending they like each other, but they're actually plotting to kill each other. And unfortunately, there's more and more of that in our world. So I decided to do this talk to sort of look at what your options are if this starts to happen to you. So without further ado, oh, right, I'm using this thing. I forgot. What is a frenemy? Well, this is somebody who claims to be your friend, but is working against your efforts. Um, I used to work for Intel, and they used a lot of neuro-linguistic programming on, on their employees, uh, of which I was one. And uh, one example of that was the use of um, the term fellow travelers, in quotes, <laughs> which they used to describe both competitors and partners in an effort to not seem to be a monopoly. Um, the problem with fellow travelers in the commercial world playing into open source is they often have a lot more money to spend than the open source project, and they can make it look like a much more interesting place, their fork. Uh, or they can just try to take over the main project. And this is an example of friendly behavior. Um, another one, which is more in keeping with the open source world, is when former community members want to go another way. Um, that's why forking exists in open source licenses, is so that people who have been past contributors can make another choice, try to get the thing to work the way they think it should work. Uh, and those are, friend, you know, but friendly might be the wrong word, but let's say those are allowable forks because that's part of the open source ecosystem. Um, another example, however, of frenemy behavior that I'm seeing more and more is advocates who sow fear, uncertainty, and doubt about your open source project, <laughs> um, whether or not they're involved in a parallel effort. So sort of gratuitous naysayers and especially influencers can really uh, wreak havoc when that happens. Okay, so um, sorry about the sorry about the almost unreasonable type. I, I apologize about that. It looked better last night when I was working on it. Okay, examples of um, unhelpful actions that frenemies might take. First of all, hostile forks. That's a fork where, in, in the parlance, mostly like, you as a as a community. We're not looking for your code to be spun into another effort, but it's happened. Maybe because some of the community members wanted to do something different, um, maybe as a disruptive move by a big player. There's lots of reasons why this happens. Um, some really ex uh, well-known examples of this, um, OpenOffice, uh, which now lives at Apache, and LibreOffice are uh, examples of a hostile fork where the parties in the two communities don't really play together nicely at all. And there's been substantial shift. And, you know, I was involved in the open office project originally, and I've said publicly, I believe that LibreOffice is winning that battle, but um, it's definitely a battle. So that's a frenemy action. Another one would be Sun's work with Java back in the day. Um, which was not open source, and Apache Harmony, which was an effort to create an open source version of um, that language, which Sun saw as a hostile fork. And they might be right, because it was funded by IBM and Intel. So <laughs> anyway, another one is ownership conflict. Um, we see this a lot uh, in areas that are going to be commercially viable as open source projects. And when I say commercially viable, I mean they're going to generate revenue for the entity that is that is applying the hostile fork rules. So um, there are some projects uh, at the Linux Foundation that are only there because the Linux Foundation spun up a competing effort in the same arena and um, basically sucked all of the fundraising out of the 
situation. And so the, the smaller foundation had to join the Linux Foundation in order to become whole in their fundraising. An example of this would be Finos. Now, I think they're enjoying being at the Linux Foundation, but it wasn't a choice they had. They pretty much had to go there. Another one is um, simple charter conflicts. And the best one I can think of is BSD, OpenBSD and FreeBSD. For those of you who don't know, um, BSD, Berkeley Source Distribution, is another version of Linux that's not, I'm sorry, of, of uh, Unix that's not Linux. It's as old, maybe older. Um, started actually by Bill Joy uh, when he was doing his graduate work at University of California at Berkeley. Um, that community is an old and very well-established community, but there was, uh, many years ago, uh, a pretty big schism between the main community and a very small group of security wonks who really wanted to focus on making BSD that was very, very secure. And um, led by Theo Durad, they famously sp spun up another effort. Um, and, you know, publicly said, we're not trying to replace BSD in popularity in the world. We just needed to be more secure and we're gonna work on that to the exclusion of everything else. And we'll try to stay in step with regular BSD. Um, and they, they mostly do that, but um, they are the most secure. And interestingly enough, when the heart bleed situation happened a few years ago, they were the first to have a viable patch and which they then shared with the rest of the BSD community. So it's not always a bad thing. Um, another example of this is, is would be GNOME versus KDE. Um, GNOME was one way of addressing a Unix front end that was open source. KDE was another way. Um, they have coexisted for a very long time. Um, a lot of industry put their money behind GNOME at one point, but KDE continued and that's, we'll talk about that more later. Um, counter marketing can be a problem. Um, we had this F issue a couple of years ago at Intersource Commons where the Software Freedom Law Center felt concerned about um, Intersource as a potential plot to undermine free software, which it absolutely was not. It was, they gave us a lot of detail. Um, it was apparently a plot that I, myself, and Tim O'Reilly, who is my friend, and Bill Gates got together to <laughs> perpetrate. Uh, it didn't actually involve um, chips in anybody's arm or anything, but the funny bit was that Bill Gates hates both Tim and I. <laughs> so that was not actually a thing at all. <laughs> um, so, but counter marketing can be damaging, especially to you know loyalists that are listening to those influencers. And then territorial conflicts, another example. So for instance, when I was at Wikipedia, um, Chinese Wikipedia was famously full of alternate truths to the truth that is generally accepted in the West. And in Taiwan, they ran a version that was a translation of, um, say, English Wikipedia, so a much more Western take on things. And the, the amazing thing is that they were tunneling that content into China. Now, obviously, if you used that content, you were subject to some problems in, the, in China for, you know, looking at the wrong things. But um, I always applaud the bravery of the Taiwanese and, and the people in China who ingested that information, because, of course, I think that everybody should understand each other's point of view. Another example of a territorial conflict would be AWS and Elasticsearch, but we're going to talk about that more in a second. Okay, so what can you do if this comes up? Um, it's really hard to, with a fork, do better than the original project. Obviously, you can throw money at stuff, but there is a first mover advantage unless the original product is kind of asleep at the wheel and not realizing that they're being imitated or that their, their situation has changed. So it's important to stay vigilant and understand when this is happening. Time is actually on your side uh, because it's so difficult to get this right from outside the project. Um, it doesn't usually feel that way, however. And uh, as with engineers diving into code before a design has been validated, it's really common for open source projects to dive into a response when waiting probably would have done them better. Um, because of the small community that open source represents, I mean, we're only somewhere less than 10% of the total engineering community in the world, and we kind of all know each other, and everything's transparent. Backbiting is really seldom secret. So when people try to message or, or 
influencers go in and try to, you know, talk about a project behind its back. It's really common for somebody to come to the project's aid. And that certainly happened um, in the whole AWS Elasticsearch thing um, before Elasticsearch made a choice to change their license. Um, it's definitely happened for us in Intersource Commons. The first time we heard about that conflict we were having was a friend of ours rebutting um, in, in a tweet stream a presentation about this whole plot thing. Um, and then because open source is people, public opinion can create real advantage. So it's worth staying connected to the people of open source. And, and um, that's one of the mitigations we're gonna talk about. Okay, so here's the first mitigation we're gonna talk about. Don't, the, the one possibility, and 99% of the time this is the right thing to do, ignore it. There are a lot of hostile forks that aren't gonna ever reach liftoff and at least for some period of time you should monitor but not expend energy reacting and that's really hard for open source people to do but I, there's lots of data that shows that it does make more sense to spend some time assessing the situation before you react um, examples of this strategy the best one i can think of is postgres and my my sequel so these are old projects when mysql was everybody's darling because it was part of the lamp stack postgres looked like the tortoise in the tortoise and the hare but we weren't sure what was going to happen there well now 20 years later we can say postgres actually won part of why postgres won or is currently winning is because mysql gained new ownership that was maybe hostile to continuing to you know, make it the thing. People didn't trust the new ownership. Um, I don't blame them. But mostly Postgres as not exactly, more, MySQL wasn't a fork of Postgres, but it was so adjacent that it was often compared and they both took the high road. It was really rare for anybody from either camp to knock the other project. And um, you know, Postgres won in the sense that it continued to improve and continued to improve now it now the Citus Data, which is one of the big contributors, now belongs to Microsoft. Like it's gaining um, interest, but it's still a standalone project, which is important. Um, so anyway, staying friends offers you way more options in in fixing one of these things. So that's my first piece of advice. Next, I say um, it's possible to display high moral ground and gain some traction in the minds of the you know, large open source community, the techno uh, tech uh, bureaucracy, technocracy, <laughs> if you will, open technocracy. So um, explaining your efforts superiority, if you can possibly do it without directly dissing the frenemy, um, or if you can't do that, that's the highest moral ground you can have. If you can't do that, then um, something close to that uh, is, is, the thing to do but it can still go south and the the best example of this i can think of right now is audacity and tenacity audacity was a cross-platform open source tool for sound processing that um, everybody used and they didn't realize that they were about to be challenged by a corporate backed competitor um, by the time they figured out that the that it was a problem and it was eating their market share they um didn't have a lot of uh, options. They did a really interesting thing. And if you if you like a good, there's a beautiful thread about this on Twitter, and there's a couple of articles in the register if you look up Audacity. They, um, they wrote a very no holds barred post to the open source community about why they were changing their licensing. And then they became acquired by a deeper pocket in an, a you know, sort of Hail Mary effort to try to get it right. They're not so open now, but, um, they could have avoided this if they'd known their community better and taken early steps to make it clear to tenacity that that was a you know not a nice thing to do basically and i know niceness doesn't always win but i like to think it, that it, it wins more often than you might think okay strategy three is fight and a lot of people go straight to strategy three but i think it's worth spending a minute assessing the situation which is why i said Strategy one should be don't respond, just try to understand what's happening. Okay, so who fights well? Um, 
my son did this successfully with Microsoft, but it took them a long time. They had to, you know, allow Microsoft to be a bad player. This is, of course, not in the open source world. Um, another example of this would be the way that AWS and Elasticsearch have um, done the dance. You know, Elasticsearch, of course, uh, for those of you who don't know, AWS put up a version of Elasticsearch in its common services available to our subscribers that was, uh, you know, a fork. It didn't have all the same features as the, the current version of Elasticsearch. And um, it was only available to people that were paying AWS money to use their service or, well, or involved in that ecosystem. Um, Elasticsearch saw its direct business start to fade and decided that they were going to undergo a licensing change to try to forestall that and became a proprietary project. And so this is seen as one of the big issues in open source now for sustainability is that large cloud companies can really have an influence on the viability of an open project. Um, I think they didn't do enough work to get people behind them because they seem to think that the fact that they were open made them golden when in fact they had chosen the wrong business model, which is why they were vulnerable. Open source is not a business model. And it's really important to always remember that when thinking about, you know, frenemy action. Um, anyway, I think that, that uh, what they did in the long run is going to be good for Elasticsearch and maybe also good for AWS, but not so good for open source, which means that there will inevitably be a contender that, you know, does a better job in the clear because that's one of the ways that you disrupt a, a market like search engine markets. Um, I mean, there's already solar and solar's the second best after, after Elastic. So um, I actually think that open office at, at Apache is um, doing a version of this. That's not healthy. They're continuing to fight um, and try to be a viable project, even though they're years behind now on serving um, any kind of customer base. And LibreOffice is effectively the only one that's ever used anymore. Um, it's a quirk of the way that Apache works that it hasn't been addict yet. There's always one or two people who are really gung-ho to somehow make a dent in the Apache OpenOffice. And unfortunately, the hangup appears to be a licensing disagreement rather than um, a sincere desire to put out the best technology, which I think is a, a black mark on Apache. But, and I do love Apache, but I think they got this wrong. Okay, um, next. By the way, I can't see you guys. So <laughs> if you're hating this talk, I apologize. <laughs> and if you have things you want to ask me, hopefully we'll have a little time at the end. Okay, another strategy is to just absorb the competition. This, if you have the wherewithal to do this, can be really a good thing. Um, there are lots of examples of this in commercial open source. That's where a company has taken an open source project and you know offered services against it or done custom install stuff. This, this is sort of the Red Hat model. Um, but then there'll be pretenders that want to take up that space, claiming that this is not a pure effort. Um, if it's run sort of ethically, it, it might still be a pure effort. Cloudera is an example of this. Um, Doug Cutting, who, you know, created Hadoop at Apache, helped co-found Cloudera to commercialize it. Um, the Hadoop project at Apache continu continued to enjoy upstream contributions from Cloudera up until, you know, the moment that they, they uh, shifted um, and IPO'd and, and became a bigger concern. Um, another example of this would be Canonical and Debian, where you know they forked from Debian. They continue to feed Debian patches and try to um, stay in, involved there. Um, in both cases, there was an opportunity maybe for one to take over the other. Um, I know in Debian's case, Mark Shuttleworth decided you know, early on not to go there because the collective good nature of the Debian community and especially the academic appeal of it, um, although it didn't match his plans for commercialization, was still a precious part of that whole. And so that, that it gives you an example of a more enlightened version of understanding what to do there. And I'm not 
excusing Mark for any of the missteps he's ever made, but um, I do think he genuinely tried. I think that Mike Olson also and, and um, Doug Cutting genuinely tried to uh, make that work. Another example is Drupal. Drupal needed an object model a few years ago, and Dries, who is you know staunchly free software guy, um, went looking and found an open source alternative that he could use in Drupal, which is Symfony. And um, as it fits in Drupal, you know stuff that works for Drupal that don't already exist in Symfony get sent back to Symfony. Uh, for incorporation if they want to do that. Um, because of the size of the Drupal community, that that counts as an absorbing, I think, because it made it into the main code base of a larger project. Okay, um, we're almost to the end of possible mitigations I thought of. Another one is to just simply study what they're doing. Why are they winning? And then improve. And improving might include offering to be absorbed. It might include appealing to the community with why your effort is a better effort than the other one. Um, there's lots of room in open source for parallel efforts that appear to compete to peacefully coexist, like Postgres and MySQL. Um, it doesn't always have to be a fight. If, if a fork is more popular than yours, there might be a reason. <laughs> but this is my moment to say just a, mo just a piece about my concerns um, about what I hear coming from Europe around the topic of digital sovereignty. And because I'm not in Berlin, I didn't get to hear sort of the latest on all of this from all of you in the coffee rooms. But my concern with what I've heard so far, and I do live in Europe and you know spend a lot of time thinking about this, is a lot of the digital sovereignty that I'm hearing is confused with a nationalism. And how that expresses itself is an effort to create services that only benefit certain groups of people. And I hear these conversations mostly in the OSPO++ parts of my practice and work. Um, it indicates a misunderstanding of what open source is. Open source must be set up so that all the boats rise. There is no borders. <laughs> There's no excluding people. And if you're gonna do that, then you're not doing open source and you need to stop talking about open source and digital sovereignty in the same exact sentence, um, I think, because I think it confuses the issue. Um, I would like to see more open source happening in Europe. Um, we know that it's mostly coming from small and medium enterprises. They seem to stall in growing, scaling out, partly because of the way the VC community works or doesn't work in Europe. I think all of this is fixable. I've seen it work in other places um, that you might not know about, such as Sri Lanka, where they have a very um, established open source practice and a lot of viable companies that are open source based. But um, I don't think that what I hear most of the time in these digital sovereignty talks comprehends the fact that you can't create borders in open source. And that worries me a little bit. So I spend a fair amount of time talking about that, but that's not actually a mitigation strategy for the topic at hand. So I'll leave that off now and come to my, my end of this part. And if there are questions, it looks like I have a couple minutes anyway um, to take questions or have conversation if that's possible on this platform. So um, I guess I am now asking <laughs> the people that run this conference if they'd like to step in and um, let me know if it's possible to do Q&A and if there are any questions or conversations that people want to have. Yes, I think we have some time left. So are there any questions, comments, uh, remarks? Uh, no, I don't. Don't be shy, guys. <laughs> Come on, this is what we're here for. Mm, let me have a look at our online platform, but I think we don't have questions there. But let me say that I uh, really liked your uh, closing remarks uh, on this talk um, about the digital sovereignty, and um, I, yeah, I feel like a lot of people here in the room feel the same. Yeah, we have to do a better job of educating these these basically politicians. Um, it, one of the things that the FOSBAC audience in particular needs to realize is there is a vanishingly small percentage of people in the world that know how to build healthy open source communities. And, and I mean, it is a very rare skill. 
And we are some of those people. Um, but there aren't enough of us to do an effective job of covering the demand that is out to happen, is happening and is about to happen for these skills. And so, you know, in, in the same way that we worry about frenemies, <laughs> we need to worry about scarcity and not there not being enough of us to keep them on the straight and narrow and not going down nationalist roads. Um, now, of course, they could go that way. China did it, right? Uh, but it, I think the China experiment of the last 10 years and Baidu shows pretty clearly that it doesn't work very well because there are entities like Taiwanese Wikipedia <laughs> and there, there are people who get it that, it that all boats have to rise. So um, anyway, that's what I have to say about that. <laughs> we just need to be louder about it. We need to be consistent and um, kind because they're, they're jumping to conclusions based on what they know it's really hard for people to understand, especially people who've been steeped in direct competition to understand how coopetition works, how, how collaboration really works, you know. Okay, thank you for this great talk. I think there are no more questions from the audience here. Um, so yeah, thanks again. Thank you so much. And I hope to come back next year and see you guys in person.